at the next lecture. So we are very happy to have uh, Professor Deeptiman Sen from ISC Bangalore, and he'll be giving a set of three lectures to us on uh, various aspects of the Kitaib model. So Deeptiman originally trained as a high energy physicist, but then it was very nice for us that he started working on condensed matter problems, uh, both equilibrium and non-equilibrium stuff. And of course, to this audience, he doesn't need too detailed an introduction. So over to you. Yeah. OK, so first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give uh, this, these talks on the Kitaev model. Um, so, uh, so I'll talk about various aspects of the Kitaev model. Some of them I have worked on with collaborators myself, so um, I'll go over those more slowly. And then I'll also mention a few other things which I have not worked on myself, so I don't know them very well. But I'll mention them for your benefit, so that you know, if you want, you can look up those references that I'll mention and learn more about the Kitaev model. Okay, so there are certain things I'll do in detail, and certain other things I will not. Um, so feel free to ask questions at any point. You know, it, it's really important that you understand everything that I say. Um, it's not so important that I, you know, I actually cover whatever I plan, but you should understand whatever I have to say. Okay, so please free, feel free to interrupt at any point. So the outline of the talk is, uh, first I'll tell you a little bit about Majorana fermions in general. This is useful because the exact solution of the Kitaev model actually uses the idea of Majorana fermions. So let me, I'll just spend a couple of slides telling you about what Majorana fermions are. Then I'll tell you about the actual Kitaev model. Uh, we'll see that there are a lot of conserved quantities in this model, infinite number of them in fact. And that's what helps us to solve, find the energy spectrum of this model completely. So after discussing the conserved quantities, I'll discuss the ground state and low energy excitations. Uh, then say a little bit about correlation functions. Uh, then various generalizations of the Kitaev model that various people have worked on. Uh, something about Kitaev type material. So this is um, the only contact I'll make with some experiments. Um, and then uh, I'll talk about a largest version of the Kitaev model. So the Kitaev model itself is a spin half model, but it's interesting to look at what happens if you take the spin to be very large instead of half. And you can develop something called spin wave theory. And I'll spend actually a lot of time on this last point because for various reasons. One is that uh, we'll also learn how to do spin wave theory looking at this. And then you'll discover that various interesting things appear in the calculation when you discuss the largest limit like dimer coverings of the honeycomb lattice, self-avoiding walks and things like that. Okay, so that's the outline. And I think this will only actually cover maybe one and a half lectures. So for the remaining one and a half, uh, <laughs> not very sure what I'll do. I'll probably talk about the toric code model, which is a particular limit of the Kitaev model, and then various other things. Okay. All right, so, um, so let me carry on. So this is a picture of Kitaev, and uh, this is the article which really started the whole thing. Uh, it's a fantastic article, 110 pages or so, very dense. And so, of course, I'm only going to talk about a very small part of this paper. Uh, so the important features of the Kitaev model, the reason why so many people are interested in it, is that it's one of the few completely solvable quantum spin models in two dimensions. There are lots of solvable models in one dimension. This is one of the rare models in two dimensions which you can solve completely. Uh, it maps to a problem of non-interacting Majorana fermions, as we will see. The excitations in this model have abelian or non-abelian statistics. So this, this third point, I won't be able to go into great detail. Uh, so I'm just stating it here. I'll explain what abelian or non-abelian statistics are, but I won't be able to show you really that the excitations have these kinds of statistics in this model. And then this model also has something called topological order. So this is actually uh, one of the models with which has a topological phase. So those are the kinds of motivations for studying the Kitaev model. Okay, so first of all, what are Majorana fermions? So a Majorana fermion um, operator is something which anti-commutes with all other fermion operators. Uh, so in that way, they are like any other fermion operator. But what is special about Majorana operators is that they are also Hermitian. Okay, uh, so M dagger is the same as M. Um, 
So, uh, so in that sense, it's like an operator which is, uh, I mean, it's it, you can say that it describes particles which are their own antiparticles. Okay, but that's really a terminology from high energy physics. In in the condensed matter setting, we don't really talk about a particle as such. It, it, Maranov fermions are there, even if you don't have uh, particles and antiparticles in a system. I mean, at least the operators are there. Whether you actually observe them in a certain model or not depends on that model. Okay. Uh, any fermionic model actually can be written in terms of Maranov fermions. Okay. It's just a mathematical way of writing things at the moment. Okay. Now we can, of course, normalize it. Um, and so the conventional normalization is m squared is one. You could have chosen some other number, but let's choose m squared equal to one. Now, if you have two different Maranov operators, let's say m1 and m2, so each of them is Hermitian then um, they anti commute with each other okay so that's the fermionic uh, anti commutation relation now um, the way to make physical sense of Majorana fermions is very hard to make sense of one Majorana operator m okay so the only way known to make sense of physical sense of Majorana operators is if you have a pair of them m1 and m2 then you can combine them to form a standard Fermion operator. Okay, so you can define a d, which is one by root two. This is just for normalization. One by root two times m one plus i m two, and then of course d dagger is one by root two m one minus i m two. So remember, these m's are Hermitian. Then you can check that d squared is zero, d dagger squared is zero, and d and d dagger anti commute to one. Okay, so this looks like a standard uh, Fermion operator, right? You can't create two of these. Um, that is why d dagger squared is 0. So, they satisfy the exclusion principle and then of course, they satisfy the usual anti commutation relation d d dagger is 1. And then the Hilbert space for this uh, consists of two states which correspond to d dagger d equal to 0 and 1. Namely, you can either have a fermion of type d or you may not have a fermion. Okay. Okay, so, you see that when you have two Marano operators, the Hilbert space has two states. So, in general, if you have two n Majorana fermions, then you can combine them in pairs and write down, um, you can combine them in pairs and write down uh, n Dirac, uh, n usual operators and then the Hilbert space dimension should be 2 to the power n. So, that is a typo. Okay. So, if you have two n Majorana fermions, the Hilbert space dimension is 2 to the power n, not n by 2. Okay. So, please correct that. Yeah. Uh, so, the usual fermions are ones which are not um, Hermitian. Okay. So, D, so usual fermions which I will call Dirac fermions just to distinguish it from Majorana fermions, D is not the same as D dagger and the square of it is 0, D squared or D dagger squared and the anti commutator is 1. So, the difference from Majorana is that Majorana is Hermitian, M is the same as M dagger and its square is a number, okay. Okay. it is not 0. Um, now, of course, you can write any of these as matrices. So, let me give you the simplest example of Majorana fermion operators. Yeah, once, once again. So, if you just take two of the Pauli matrices, sigma x and sigma y, you can think of them as Majorana operators, two Majorana operators, right, because they are Hermitian and their square is 1. Okay. And then if you combine them like that, sigma x plus i sigma y and sigma x minus i sigma y, those are the raising and lowering operators for spin half. So, those will be like your usual Dirac fermions, sigma plus and sigma minus. But you notice that you need two, you need a pair of Majorana fermions to make an ordinary fermion. Okay, so that's why you have this funny behavior that if you double the number of Majorana fermions, the Hilbert space dimension. Um, okay, if you have two n Majorana fermions, the Hilbert space dimension is not two to the power two n, but it's only two to the power n. Yeah. Have any physical significance? So by itself, M1 or M2 don't have a physical significance. You have to t have a pair before you can make sense of it. Okay. Yes. They do sigma x and sigma y. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You can also take uh, an example of four Majorana fermions would be the Dirac gamma matrices. You can make them Hermitian, square is 1 and they all anti commute with each other. So, you can always think of operators as matrices. 
Was there another question? No. Okay, so uh, one of the uh, uses of Majorana fermions is the following. So let's say uh, there are two operators M1 and M2, which are associated with widely separated points. Okay, so there's a Majorana operator here and another one very far away. Uh, so that they don't interact with each other, then it's very difficult to disturb a state which contains a single Dirac fermion made out of those two Majorana. Okay, why is that? Because if you want to disturb this, you have to have an operator which couples to d dagger d. For example, if you're trying to disturb it using a photon, right? A photon is of course a bosonic operator, so it only can couple to d dagger d. It can't couple to d and d dagger separately. But d dagger d is one plus i m1 m2 divided by 2 it turns out, but because this m 1 and m 2 are very very far away from each other you cannot really couple to an operator like this unless your photon wavelength is very large is equal to the distance between those two Majoranas. So, if you take two Majoranas which are really very far from each other and you are limited to photons which have finite wavelengths or any other bosonic probe which only has a finite wavelength you cannot couple to uh, the Dirac fermion which is built out of these two Majoranas. So, in other words, Majorana fermions separated by large distances from each other, they provide a very robust way of storing information. It is very hard to disturb them. So, if you have a system which has one Dirac fermion, which is actually made out of two Majoranas very far from each other, it is very hard to disturb that and convert it, convert the Dirac fermion number 1 to a fermion number 0 or vice versa. Okay. Okay, so, that is uh, one reason Majorana fermions are interesting that they give you a very robust way of storing information. Um, you can think of d dagger d as 0 and 1 as a qubit. So, it is very hard to disturb such a qubit by probing it with something. Okay, now, there are various um, physically known systems where it is believed that yes. Right, yeah. So, it is very hard to manipulate it unless you bring them closer to each other. Yeah, so it is a good way of storing information, but if you want to manipulate it, then you will have to bring them close to each other. Yeah, yeah so it is difficult to have both robustness and manipulability. <laughs> uh, now, there is a there are several systems where it is believed that Majorana fermions occur. I mean, there is no uh, I do not think there is a definite experimental evidence for any of these things, but these are all various proposals. So, quantum Hall systems with filling fraction equal to 5 halves. So, that has a um, kind of variational wave uh, trial wave function called the Moore Reed wave function Fafian. Uh, so, it is believed that Majorana fermions can appear as excitations there. Um, if you have half vortices in a P wave superconductor like strontium ruthenate, then it is believed that around the core of a half vortex. Um, you have Majorana fermion excitations. Then, if you have the interface of a vortex in a standard S wave superconductor and the surface of a topological insulator, then at the interface of the vortex and the superconductor topological insulator surface, it is believed that you have Majorana excitations there. And uh, also, something called a P wave superconducting wire. So, there is a lot of excitement about this. A few years ago, there was a claim from Delft University. Uh, Coven Heavens group and then various other places, which claim to see exa um, evidence of Majorana fermions as a peak in the differential conductance uh, through this wire. Um, but I, I think it is fair to say that it is not universally accepted that this was really an evidence of Majorana fermions, because there may be other ways of explaining the peak. Also, the peak height was not 2 e squared by h, it was much smaller than that. If it was Majorana fermions, it really should have been 2 e squared by h. But anyway, so uh, this is probably the closest we have come to actually seeing a Majorana fermion. Turns out that the Kitaev, there is a Kitaev model in one dimension, not the one that I'll talk about, which is in two dimensions. But there is also a Kitaev model in one dimension, which is really a lattice way of writing down a P-wave superconducting wire. Okay, so now there are lots of papers about all these different systems, but there's a, a quick way of getting at those papers is through this uh, kind of short article by Wilczek. 
Okay, so let me say a few words about quantum statistics. So I won't discuss this in detail, but just to give you some understanding of what quantum statistics is. So in quantum mechanics, statistics refers to how the wave function of two particles changes um, when you do something to them. So what you can do is the following. If the two particles are identical, then you can exchange them and see what happens to the wave function. Okay. So for example, you know that if you take two bosons, identical bosons and exchange them, the wave function remains the same. If you take two identical fermions, and exchange them the wave function changes by sign. So, if you have two identical particles then you can exchange them and see what happens to the wave function. Even if the two particles are not identical you can still describe a statistics which is you hold one particle fixed and the other particle you move in a closed loop around it. Okay. Let us say you are in two dimensions then um, you can actually in three dimensions it does not really make sense to say that you have a closed loop around one particle because uh, you can take that loop away from that two dimensional surface and then contract it to a point. But in two dimensions you cannot take a closed loop around a point and contract it to a point. So, uh, you can ex you can ask what happens when you move one particle around another in a closed loop and this makes sense even if the two particles are not the same. Um, so, uh, so this is what is meant by quantum statistics what happens to the wave function when you do any of these processes. So, this is the first process is for two identical particles where you exchange them. The second process is for maybe two different particles, they may be identical or they may not be. You take one in a closed loop around the other. Now, if the wave particle of this two particle system, if the wave function has only one component, then all it can really do is pick up a phase under these above processes, ok. It cannot do anything else because it has got only one component. And so, it can pick up a phase which can be plus 1, minus 1 or something else. For anions, it can be e to the i theta. So, the statistics in these cases is called abelian ok, because if you do different uh, exchange different sets of particles the wave function only picks up a phase and when you do several exchanges the phase just adds up ok. So, since it adds up it is an abelian group. Uh, on the other hand if you have a more complicated system where the wave function has n components and when you do one of these processes it gets multiplied let us say by uh, n by n unitary matrix. So, it has to be unitary matrix because the probability has to be conserved under these processes because these are you know physically uh, nothing is really changing when you are doing one of these exchanges or closed loops. So, it has to be an unitary matrix acting on this n component wave function and if it turns out that the unitary matrices for different pairs of particles being exchanged do not commute with each other then the statistics is called non abelian. Okay, now, it turns out that when you have non abelian statistics this is again more robust okay, for the following reason it is really just a group theory reason. Um, if your group is abelian um, so let us say when you exchange two particles you pick up phase e to the i theta um, this theta can be changed a little bit theta to theta plus delta theta and it will not really change the group properties very much. But if you have unitary matrices satisfying some group properties uh, you cannot change it a little bit because that will completely destroy the group multiplication laws ok. okay so, matrices satisfying non abelian group properties are more tightly constrained than just ordinary phases ok. And that is why uh, non abelian statistics is uh, preferable again for the purposes of storing information or manipulating qubits ok. okay. All right. So, uh, it turns out that Majorana fermions have um, this this property that when you exchange them. So, if you have um, 2 n Majorana fermions then you actually have a Hilbert space which has dimension 2 to the power n and then exchanges of Majorana fermions actually multiplies it by uh, 2 to the power n by 2 to the power n unitary matrices and exchanging different pairs of Majorana fermions do not commute with each other. So, that is another reason for being interested in Majorana fermions that they satisfy some kind of non abelian quantum statistics ok. Um, so, now uh, so I will head towards the Kitaev model. So, it turns out that spin halves can be written in terms of Majorana fermions in fact there are many ways of doing this. Um, so, all of these different ways satisfy the anti commutation relations at the same si side j. So, uh, spin halves as you know at the same side they have to satisfy anti commutation relations the three Pauli matrices. 
and uh, different spin halves commute operators commute with each other. So, at different sides g and k. So, when you write a spin half in terms of Marana fermions, it has to satisfy the usual spin relations. So, one way of writing spin halves in terms of Marana fermions is the following. Uh, so, you write sigma x at side j as a product of say b y and b z. So, you introduce three Marana fermions at every site okay. and you write the Pauli matrices in these ways okay. sigma x, sigma y and sigma z in terms of b x, b y, b z in the cyclic product sense. So, you can check using this anti commutation relation that I gave you earlier that um, if you write this i b b kind of terms then they actually behave like the Pauli matrices. So, the square they are Hermitian squares are 1 and they are anti commute with each other. Okay. Um, I believe this um, formulation was first given by uh, Sriram Shastri many years ago. Okay, so, that is one way of writing spin halves in terms of Marana fermions. Another way of doing this which was actually proposed by Kitaev in this long paper is to use 4 Marana fermions. So, you can write sigma x as some c times c x, sigma y as c times c y and sigma z as c c z where this c and c x y z are all Marana fermions and the physical you have to impose a constraint that the physical states are those which satisfy the product of these four Maranas acting on the state is equal to 1. Okay. Now, uh, the problem with these representations of spin halves is that they all uh, unnecessarily increase the dimension of the Hilbert space. So, they give you some redundant state. So, let us see how why that is. So, if you think of spin half a single spin half it has a Hilbert space of dimension 2 right it acts on because the Pauli matrices are 2 by 2 matrices. However, if you have 4 Marana fermions then the Hilbert space dimension is 2 to the power 4 by 2, 2, 2 squared which is 4 states. So, you really have a physical space which is 2 dimensional, but here you get a 4 dimensional space. So, that is why you need to put in this constraint to get rid of 2 of those states. Okay. Um, similarly, here you can show that you have more states that you need. Okay. So, uh, so, while we can work with these representations and and put appropriate conditions to um, get rid of the unphysical states, uh, it is uh, it's, it's a bit painful. Okay. So, we are going to follow a different route where uh, we have Marana fermions, but we are not going to introduce any redundant states. Okay. Uh, so, this was done in all these different papers about the Kita model. Okay. Okay, so, now we really come to the Kita model. So, what this model is, it has got spin halves sitting on the sides of a honeycomb lattice and uh, they have highly anisotropic couplings between nearest neighbors. Okay. So, on a honeycomb lattice there are three kinds of bonds right. So, let me call them the x bond, the z bond and the y bond. So, the vertical bonds are z okay. and the, the these bonds which are almost horizontal are x and y. Now, different papers have different conventions some call this x and this y some call this y and this x does not really matter, but you have to um, look carefully at what the notation is in different papers. So, they have three kinds of uh, bonds. So, on the z bond the two uh, spin halves at the two ends of the z bond have a coupling which is some coupling j 3 times sigma z sigma z between these two spins. Then there is a coupling here which is j 1 times sigma x sigma x and then there is a j 2 which is sigma y sigma y. Okay. So, that is the definition that is the Hamiltonian of the Kitta model. Okay. Spin, these are all spin half, these are all spin half operators. So, at every side there is a spin half. Okay. So, this yeah. So, you have sigma x sigma x and sigma y and so on. Is, was that the question? there is no particular limit. See you can see there is a highly anisotropic. So, the same spin sitting here has a z you know sigma z coupling with this spin, sigma x coupling with this spin and a sigma y coupling with that spin. So, there is really no symmetry here I mean there is no continuous rotational symmetry. There are some discrete symmetries it turns out right you can flip sigma x to minus sigma x, sigma y to minus sigma y. So, around the gist, uh, bonding yeah. Uh, there is no such uh, sigma x or sigma, sigma x type. That is right yeah. So, it is very peculiar Hamiltonian. So, along the z uh, the vertical bonds you only have sigma z sigma z kind of coupling. Okay. Um, so, you know for a while we are just going to discuss this model as it is, 
and then later I will discuss Kita materials and you will see where this kind of you know thing can actually appear in real systems. Okay, so, we have three different couplings along the three bonds, uh, it turns out that you can assume that all these couplings are positive or 0. Okay. Even if some of them were negative you can actually make them positive by doing some unitary transformations. Okay, so, we have that degree of freedom and so, let us me assume that all these couplings are positive. Okay, so, now um, the way to solve this model, okay, so I am now going to show you in detail how you find the spectrum how you you know find the exact energy spectrum of this model. Um, so, you do something called the Jordan Wigner transformation. Okay. Now, uh, many of you may know what the Jordan Wigner transformation is in one dimension right. It is a mapping from spin halves to spinless fermions. Uh, the reason this works is that a spin half has two degrees of freedom right up and down and a fermion also have two degrees of freedom you know the fermion number can be 0 or 1. So, at least the number of states are equal in the two cases. Uh, that does not immediately make it clear that you can map one to the other, but it turns out that in one dimension you can actually make a mapping. If you have a lattice model with spin halves you can map it to a model of fermions ok. And this actually um, uh, helps to solve many spin problems exactly in one dimension. But um, Usually, Jordan Wigner transformations they can be done in any dimension, but they are not very useful in 2 and 3 dimensions usually. Okay. So, the Kita model is one of the very rare examples of a model where you can do a Jordan Wigner transformation and it works that you actually get a useful Hamiltonian which you can whose spectrum you can solve exactly. So, we will see why it works in the Kita model in a few minutes. Okay. Yes. Uh, it is not just that you get an interacting fermion, you get a um, you get a model where fermions have very long range couplings, infinitely long range couplings ok. That is really the problem ok. So, we will see why that happens ok. So, um, so this is how the John Wigner transformation goes. So, let me just step back a little bit. Um, so, you have these different rows right. So, so, uh, let me use a label um, I think the label L is the label for the row ok. So, let, let us say this is L even then this is L odd this is L even and so on. So, L is the label for the rows and J is the label for the columns right. So, this is say J equals 1 L equals um, 2 then L equals 2 J equals 2 L equals 3 J equals 2 and so on ok. So, along this L uh, J changes then in this direction L changes ok. Okay, so, the transformation to Majorana fermions from the spin house goes like this. So, for every uh, for the even number chains you define a an object A which is the product of all the sigma z's coming before that site multiplied by sigma y at that site. Excuse me. Yes. In the previous slide you showed that uh, you told that if uh, one of the j i's or two of the j i's are negative you can always transform it into positive. So, what if all of them are negative? You can transform all of them to positive. Okay. Yeah. So I didn't show you the transformation, but you have to do something appropriate to the sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z, right? Um, okay. All right. So let me go back a little bit. So suppose you are at this site, and so what I'm saying is, okay. Suppose you are at this site. So what I'm saying is that you can map the spin half into a object which is A which is the product of all the sigma z's from the beginning of the lattice um, the product of sigma z's uh, which goes up to the side before it and then multiplied by sigma y ok. Ok, this will become clear in a couple of slides I mean I am there is only so much I can write on one slide <laughs> ok. So, uh, so you have a product of sigma z's um, uh, from, from say minus infinity. Yeah. yeah, you have a product of sigma z's from minus infinity, which is the beginning of the lattice at some point. Let's say the top left corner of the lattice, product along sigma z's uh, up to the site which is just before it, before n, and then at site n you have sigma y. So that is the definition of the A for the even-numbered chains. 
for the odd number change you do the same thing but instead of sigma y you have a sigma x ok. Um, then there are three more but go ahead what is the question. Oh, is it easier to see the structure if you just uh, deform the lattice into a brick wall then you can actually see the chains or um, maybe but it is not so bad. So, I will tell you exactly how this string of sigma z's right, go right. yeah uh, in a second ok yeah. Yeah, then it becomes more messy. You can still do it, but it becomes more messy then. So, uh, let us assume a finite system for the moment, ok. Actually, the same problem happens in one dimensional systems. When you do this Jordan Wigner, it is a bit, bit more messy when you have periodic boundary conditions, ok. So, it is easier to do it for finite systems, but there is you can actually wor work it out for even with periodic boundary conditions, ok. Ok, so that is the definition of A. Then, um, so, product of sigma z times a sigma y for even number chains. If you put a sigma x, that is a different operator. So, I will call that C. Uh, so, at every site, either you have a sigma, you end with a sigma x or a sigma y, and that gives you an A or a C, ok, for even, uh, and it is the other way. So, it is A for sigma y for even number chains, A with sigma x for odd number chains, and so on, ok. So, that is the definition of A and C, provided these ends lie on the A sub lattice, ok. So, there are many different conditions. So, the honeycomb lattice is a bipartite lattice right. So, it has made out of A sub lattices and B sub lattices. So, these definitions of A and C that I gave you are for sites which lie on the A sub lattice ok. This is something I forgot to tell you earlier. So, I hope it is clear that the honeycomb lattice is a bipartite lattice. So, for every vertical bond I the top sites are from the A sub lattice and the bottom sites from the B sub lattice. Ok. So, for the A sub lattice sites we have these two operators A and C, for the B sub lattice sites we have these two operators B and D. So, here again you have a string of sigma z's um, and then the last point you have a sigma x for even number chains and sigma y for odd number chains and D is the other way ok. So, this looks very messy and I do not expect you to follow all this, but basically at every site if it is an A sub lattice site then you have two operators which are called A and C. And if it is a B sub lattice site, then you have two operators which I call B and D, ok. Right. I hope that makes sense because if a spin half has two degrees of freedom. So, you actually have two Majoranas describing it. So, either it is A C or B D. So, yeah. this formulation I yeah. mean, given the Kitab model is on the honeycomb lattice uh, requires a bipartite, bipartite lattice to be there. I mean. Um, because now I they are carrying different quantum numbers in some sense the Mara, I mean the fermions. Yeah. I, mean I guess that is true yeah all the examples I can think of of the generalizations of the Kitai model I think they are all bipartite yeah. Okay. So, I think you are right ok. So, now uh, let me uh, answer this question is how exactly do you take the string of sigma z's ok. Now, it turns out that there are many different ways of taking this string, but the simplest way is this. So, we are assuming we have a finite system right. So, open system not periodic boundary condition. So, what you do is that you start at the top left corner and then you take a product of sigma z running like this. So, you go along this right and then you when you come here then you sort of go down and then you go the other way ok. So, that is the that let us take that as the standard path of how you define this product of sigma z ok. Ok. So, the string of sigma z is chosen to go along this x y bonds towards the right if you are on an even number chain and towards the left if you are on an odd number chain. So, it basically winds back and forth right as you go along the lattice ok. So, now you can check that all these uh, a's and uh, they are all uh, they are all Majorana operators. So, you can check that they um, if you take two a's at different sides the anti commutator is 0 if they are the same side then a squared is 1 then the uh, same, same for the B's, C's and D's and the different Majoranas anti commute with each other. So, A with B is 0, A with C is 0 and so on ok. So, you can uh, check this, but uh, you can see it from here. So, first of all you can see that they are all Hermitian right, because they are all built out of the Pauli matrices. So, they are obviously Hermitian. If you square any one of them you get 1 because the square of every Pauli matrix is 1. You can see that the A's and C's anti commute because one has sigma y, the other has sigma x. So, A's and C's anti commute. 
you can also check that A is at two different sides anti commute and there you find that you need this string of sigma z ok. okay so, this, this string of sigma z is really very important to get, give you the anti commutation between these operators at two different sides, because the Pauli matrices commute at different sides. So, you have to add something to make um, an operator which anti commutes at different sides. So, this string of sigma z does that job. Sorry, by chains I mean rows. Yes, right. Yeah. So these are the these are the chains, the horizontal rows. Yeah. Okay. So we now have a bunch of operators A is A, B, C, and D. Okay. Now um, now we go back to this Hamiltonian. So, what you can do is now try to rewrite this Hamiltonian in terms of those Majorana operators A, B, C and D that I described for you and I will I'll skip some steps here, but you can work this out very easily. You will discover that the x x and y y interactions which couple neighboring sites in the same row or same chain, they actually become local and quadratic in the Majorana fermions under this when you do this Jordan Wigner transformation. Okay. In other words, if you take this, this interaction, this is an x and x right. Uh, this is an A site and that is a B site. So, when you take this spin interaction sigma x sigma x, you will see that it actually just becomes A times A here times B here. Okay. So, it becomes something which is very local, it just involves two neighboring sites and it is a product, it is a product of just two operators A and B. Okay. Similarly, if you take this uh, y y interaction sigma y sigma y, uh, in terms of Majorana fermions, it becomes B here times A here. So, along the rows all the interactions become like, so x x become a b and the y y is become b a. Okay. So, the interactions along the rows are very simple, they all become local and product of just two oper fermion operators. Now, the z z interaction is the troublesome thing. So, this couples two sites on neighboring rows. So, z z interaction couples a site on this row with a site on the next row and usually what would happen is that um, the coupling between this and this will usually involve this whole string of sigma z's. Okay. So, let me go back a little bit. So, if you take a product of let us say a sigma this sigma x with this sigma x, what happens to the string of sigma z's which is there in the Majoranas? The point is that if you take these two couplings in the same row, the product of sigma z's cancel with each other, right? Because each of them has the product of sigma z's and sigma z squared is 1. So, when you take two sides next to each other in the same row, this long product of sigma z that you have before it they cancel each other. So, it, you get something which is just involves the fermions there, but if you take a coupling between this side and that side, this side has only a product of sigma z from here to there, but this side has a product of sigma z all the way going to the end and coming back. So, when you multiply those two, this part of the sigma z is common, so that cancels out but uh, you have this product of sigma z's hanging around right okay so this coupling z z coupling between these two sides involve fermions at these two sides times the product of sigma z's all the way around here okay so you get this very troublesome string of sigma z's which remain when you couple two sides by a vertical bond okay okay so um, so the z z interaction normally becomes non local and actually uh, this is wrong, it is not quartic, it is just non local, it involves the product of a large number of sigma z's, much worse than quartic. Okay. And so, this is why the Jordan Wigner transformation generally is not useful in 2 and 3 dimensions. You can do it, but Hamiltonians which are local in terms of spins become highly non local in terms of fermions, the vertical bonds. Okay. Now, of course, uh, it is a matter of convention which one you call vertical bond. But if you have three different kinds of bonds in three directions, two of them will become local, the third will always become non local in general. However, so this is one of the miracles of the Kitaev model that even the z z interaction remains local and only couples fermions on nearest neighbor sites because this model has a large number of conserved quantities. Okay. So, let us see what how that happens. Okay. So, it turns out that on the Kitaev model there is a conserved quantity associated with every hexagon. 
Okay, so let's take this hexagon. It has the sides 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. The conserved quantity I'll call it W. So it, it's a product of six spin operators as follows. So there's a sigma 1 y, sigma 2 z, sigma 3 x, and so on. Okay. The rule is very simple that at every point the component of sigma that you have is the one which is pointing away from that hexagon. So remember this is a y y bond, right? So you get a sigma 1 y appearing in W. When you come to site number 2, the bond pointing away from the hexagon is the z z bond. So, you get a sigma 2 z. Okay. So, that is how you define the w. Now, of course, it is very clear that w is Hermitian because each of these terms is Hermitian and they of course, all commute with each other because there are different sites. The square of w is 1 because the square of each of these is 1. Now, this is the important thing that the all the w's commute with each other and they all commute with h. Okay, so, let us see why that is. So, uh, the Hamiltonian H has lots of terms, let us take one of them. Let us take the term which has um, let us say coupling between these two, the y y coupling. right? So, that is one term in the Hamiltonian, the y y coupling between these two. Why does this commute with this w? Because you know this w only has a sigma 1 y there. So, that, cup, so that commutes with that, that part, that term in the Hamiltonian. Is that clear? No, because they all these six they all commute with each other. There are different sides. Okay, so this W on this hexagon commutes with this Y Y coupling because this W has a sigma Y there. So similarly, it couples it commutes with this Z Z coupling, this X X coupling, and so on. Okay, now let's look at uh, something which is a little more complicated. This W also commutes with this coupling, which is sigma one X sigma two X. That's also a term in the Hamiltonian, right? Why does this cup commute with sigma 1 x sigma 2 x? Well, if you look at this, the ha Hamiltonian has a sigma 1 x sigma 2 x, this one has a sigma 1 y sigma 2 z. Now, sigma 1 y anti commutes with sigma 1 x, but sigma 2 z also anti commutes with sigma 2 x. So, if you take the product of the two sigma x's, they commute with this, because there are two anti commutators, but the product of that gives you a commutator, uh, it gives you a commutation. Okay. So, this W also commutes with this coupling. Similarly, it commutes with this vertical coupling. So, it commutes with all the bonds around it, okay, because you have pairs of sigmas which uh, commute with each other. All right. Uh, different W's also commute with each other. So, this W of course, commutes with that W. That is obvious, because they do not have any spins in common. But uh, the claim is that this W also commutes with this W. Okay, uh, let us see why that is. So, if you are looking at the commutation of this w with that w, you can just look at the si uh, spins at sites 1 and 6, because all the other sites are disjoint from each other. right? So, we just have to worry about spins 1 and 6. Now, this w has a sigma 1 y a sigma 2 z, sorry sigma 1 y and sigma 6 x, but this w has a sigma 1 x and a sigma 6 y. So, again you know it is a matter of two different Pauli matrices which anti commute with each other, but if you take a pair of two such Pauli matrices and another pair of two such Pauli matrices they commute with each other. Okay. So, this w also commutes with that w. So, all the w's commute with each other and they all commute with the Hamiltonian. Okay. So, this is a really fantastic situation. If you have a system with n sites there are n by 2 hexagons and for so, there are n by 2 conserved quantities, right. So, huge number of conserved quantities proportional to the number of sites. Now, because each of these w's is Hermitian and square is 1, um, the eigenvalues of w are plus or minus 1, okay. And because the, the w's commute with each other and with h, you can diag simultaneously diagonalize all of them, right. So, uh, if you look at the eigenstates of H, you can also label them by the eigenstates of W's. Okay. So, now you can see that there are 2 to the power n by 2 sectors, which are labeled by the different values of W. So, one of them will be W 1 1, W 2 1, W 3 1 and so on. Another one will be W 1 is minus 1, W 2 is 1, W 3 is 1 and so on. Then you can have minus 1, minus 1, plus 1 and so on. So, all the different possible 
possibilities for the different w's which can be each of them can be plus or minus 1. Um, they are all different sectors right. By that I mean they do not mix with each other you can diagonalize all these um, w's and the Hamiltonian simultaneously. Is that clear? It is just like you know if you have a rotationally symmetric system you can diagonalize the Hamiltonian and the angular momentum operators at the same time. Similarly, here you can w uh, diagonalize the Hamilton and all the w's at the same time. Okay. Um, so, if there are n sides, so remember if there are n sides the Hilbert space is 2 to the power n because these are spin halves, but out of this 2 to the power n there are 2 to the power n by 2 different sectors. Okay. Um, so, you actually made the problem somewhat simpler instead of diagonalizing a 2, two to the n dimensional Hamiltonian you have to diagonalize the 2 to the power n by 2 dimensional Hamiltonian. Okay. Okay, now, we will see that because of this conserved quantities the z z interactions also become local in terms of Majorana fermions. Okay. So, let us say that we have these sides 1 and 2 they are on some neighboring even and odd number chains. Then you can show that the product this vertical coupling sigma 1 z sigma 2 z is actually a 1 b 2 times the product of all this w 1 w 2 w 3 and so on. Okay, you can check this. Okay. So, I am not doing it here it is not difficult, but it is just some lengthy algebra. Basically the product of this w 1 w 2 w 3 is equal to the string of sigma z s which go around. Now, we have said that all the w's commute with each other and with the Hamiltonian. So, that means in any one sector these w's are just some numbers right plus or minus 1. So, this entire quantity just becomes a 1 b 2 times something which is plus 1 or minus 1. So, as a result this product has just become something which is quadratic it is just a 1 b 2 times some number. Okay. So, something which looked highly non local actually has now just become quadratic in terms of a and b. So, then it turns out so this was shown by Kitayev in that paper that the ground state of this entire system lies in the sector in which all the w's are equal to plus 1. Okay. Um, so, that needs to be proved which I am not doing here it turns out it is not that difficult I mean there is a there is a theorem called Perron Frobenius theorem which tells you uh, uh, if you are given a certain kind of Hamiltonian then um, what is the ground the, um, the lowest energy eigenstate of the Hamiltonian should have all components positive or something. So, there is some theorem like that in linear algebra. So, using that you can show that the ground state lies in the sector where all the w's are plus 1. Uh, good point I think that also would be fine there there you can map them to each other yes. But um, yeah, so that so those two can be mapped to each other. But what you cannot do is have some of them plus ones and some of them minus ones. Actually, you, you can have even that if you choose the plus ones and minus ones carefully enough. But if you randomly take plus ones and minus one, that will not have the ground state of the system. Yeah. You mean plus one minus one plus one minus one? No, no, all are minus one. Right. Then the if the total loop number is odd then we have overall negative sign, but if the loop number is even. Yeah, but you see okay, so here here is how it goes suppose hmm. so then negative sign suppose you had a minus sign in front of this right oh, suppose you had an overall minus sign in form terms of a, a 1 b 2. Then the next thing you can do okay, so this is something that you can always do with Majorana fermions. Uh, given a Majorana fermion A you can just flip the sign of it and it remains a Majorana fermion right. Because if the only properties that a has to satisfy is that a, a is equal to a dagger and a squared is 1. So, that is true for minus a also. Okay. Also if a anti commutes with everyone else minus a also anti commutes with everyone else. So, any Majorana has this degree of freedom that you can multiply it by a minus sign. Okay. So, if you have a minus a 1 b 2 what I can do is that I can multiply this a 1 by a minus sign and I do this consistently over all these sides then I can flip the sign of all of these for all the vertical bonds. Yeah. 
Okay, so, this is one way of seeing why this z z coupling in this model because of the presence of this large number of conserved quantities why it becomes something which is only a product of two fermions. Another way of seeing this is that you can show that w 1 for example, is just a product like this it is consists of c 1 d 2 times c 3 d 4. Then the next w 2 is c 3 d 4 times c 5 d 6 and so on. So, you can see that if you multiply all of these together w 1 w 2 you will just be left with a c 1 d 2 because everything else will cancel out in pairs. Okay, so, in the sector in which all the w's are plus 1 uh, that is the same as saying that all the c 1 d 2 c 3 d 4 they are all plus 1 or maybe they are all minus 1 does not matter. And so, in this sector this Hamiltonian becomes something which is purely quadratic and it only involves a and b. Okay. So, the j 1 j 2 uh, which are along the x y bonds that I already said only involves a and b, but now what has happened is the vertical bonds also only involve a and b. Okay. Okay. So, we get a Hamilton which is purely quadratic and it only involves a and b the c and d myelinas do not appear in the Hamiltonian at all. So, the conserved quantities are the products of c's and d's okay. they do not appear in the Hamiltonian. By the way you may be puzzled about this i you need this to make it Hermitian if you just take a times b it is not it is anti Hermitian. So, you need a i a b to make it Hermitian. You actually actually you do because they um, you get this a's on the a sub lattices and b's on b sub lattices. So, it still knows that it is a bipartite lattice. Okay. So, finally, the Hamiltonian which started as a spin half Hamiltonian has become a Hamiltonian in terms of Marana fermions is purely quadratic which means is a system of non interacting Marana fermions right purely quadratic and I have written it in this form. Uh, so, by I have introduced two matri uh, two uh, vectors here m 1 and m 2. So, what I have done in writing this Hamiltonian is that I have now introduced the unit cell for this lattice. So, the unit cell is a vertical bond. So, this is one unit cell 1 2 this 3 4 is another unit cell 5 6 is another unit cell. So, these matrices m 1 and m 2 are kind of spanning vectors right. So, m 1 goes from this center of this unit cell to center of that unit cell and then uh, m 2 goes from center of this unit cell to center of this unit cell. Okay. So, these are some spanning vectors. Okay. Okay. So, they are the usual spanning vectors of um, the honeycomb lattice you get exactly the same thing if you looked at the graphene problem you get the same kind of Hamilton in there uh, except that you get um, Dirac fermions a dagger a instead of a times b Majorana fermions. Okay. So, now we are going to find the spectrum the energy spectrum of this problem. So, remember by the way this is all for particular sector where all the w's are plus 1. Okay, so, uh, we have to define the Fourier transforms to go to momentum space. So, we define them in this way. So, an interesting thing to observe here is that if you had ordinary fermions right d r d at some site r if you do a Fourier transform you just get a d k. Okay. But, when you do a Fourier transform a Meyer and a fermion you have to get both a and a dagger because it is Hermitian. Okay. So, the Fourier transform of Majorana fermion that way is quite different from the Fourier transform of an ordinary fermion. Also, okay, so, so it has to come in such a way that this is Hermitian the, this combination is Hermitian. For the same reason because this um, combination has both k and minus k this k only runs over half the Brillouin zone right because I mean k and minus k are already included there. So, this k only runs over half the Brillouin zone. So, for the honeycomb lattice you can choose the Brillouin zone to be a rhombus, but here you just need half the rhombus. Okay. So, the other half is here, but you do not need that. So, this k here this sum over k only goes over this region this is a equilateral triangle. Okay. So, this is one particular choice of half the Brillouin zone. Okay. Okay. So, that is about the Brillouin zone for Majorana fermions. So, now in momentum space you find that the Hamiltonian takes this form. So, if the sum runs over all k and half the Brillouin zone then you get something which is a dagger k b dagger k some 2 by 2 matrix a k b k. Okay. 
this 2 by 2 matrix has this form. So, it is some combination of j 3, j 1, cosine k dot m 1, cosine k dot m 2 etcetera times Pauli matrix sigma 2, sigma y let us say plus some other uh, uh, function of k times sigma 1. So, that is the Hamiltonian. So, it is just the sum of two Pauli matrices. So, once you know this you can immediately read off what the spectrum is right. If you have sigma 1 plus sigma 2 then this, uh, the eigenvalues of this is just the square root of this square plus that square right. Yes. So, a k's and b k's are now like ordinary Fermi on creation annihilation operators ok. I should have said that. Um, so, a k uh, annihilates the fermion of type a ordinary fermion type a with momentum k b annihilates the fermion of type b with momentum k. Uh, the reason you had you have half the billion zone is that you started with Majorana fermions and Majorana fermions like half an ordinary fermion. So, that is why you need only half the Brillouin zone ok. okay. So, the energy spectrum that you get from this Hamiltonian is this. So, plus or minus something ok. Now, uh, depending on the values of these three parameters j 1, j 2, j 3 there may or may not be a gap between the ground state and the first excited state. So, it turns out that there are different phases of this model. So, the phases go like this. Um, so, if each of the j's is sum of is less than the sum of the other two it turns out that the system is gapless uh, I wrote this wrong again I am sorry about that. The system is gapless at one point it is not along some lines, but it is gapless in at one particular point in the Brillouin zone ok. So, please correct that. So, if the three j's each of them is less than the sum of the other two. So, this is called the triangle inequality. So, the, the three couplings satisfy the triangle inequality then uh, the system is gapless at one particular point in half the Brillouin zone. But if any one of them is bigger than the sum of the other two then the system is gapped ok. So, there is a neat way of showing this which is the following. Uh, so, this is a uh, nice problem of high school geometry that if you take a equilateral triangle ok. First of all um, there are three parameters here j 1, j 2, j 3 and it is a little hard to show something as a function of three parameters you will have to visualize something in three dimensions. So, let us not do that. So, what we can do is let us um, rescale all the parameters. So, that the sum is 1 ok. So, that effectively it becomes a two dimensional sp parameter space right. So, just for the purpose of showing the phase diagram we can always do that. So, we rescale them. So, that the sum is 1. Now, it turns out that you can actually draw an equilateral triangle of a certain size such that if you are at any point inside the triangle. Uh, the sum of the distances of that point from the three sides is equal to 1 ok. That is the property of a equilateral triangle ok. So, if you are here then let us say the distance from this side is j 3 the distance from um, let us see this is j 3 uh, this distance from the other opposite side is j 1 this is j 2 wherever you are the sum of these three distances is always 1 ok. okay so, you can show the um, different parameters as different points inside an equilateral triangle ok. So, then in terms of this equilateral triangle this is the gapless phase ok. It is a smaller equilateral triangle in any point here um, each of these couplings is less than the sum of the other two and then there are three gapped phases. So, here j 3 is bigger than the other sum of the other two here j 2 is bigger than the sum of the other two and here j 1 is bigger. Okay, so, this is the phase diagram this is the ground state phase diagram of the Kitai model ok. okay. So, I am I, I am just making this claim that um, in these two three phases there is a finite gap between the ground state and the first excited state. In this phase there is there is no gap at, at one point in the Brillouin zone the gap is 0. Um, so, if you look at the gapless phase the energy is 0 at one particular point in the Brillouin zone. For example, if you are exactly in the middle of this equilateral triangle j 1, j 2, j 3 are all equal the energy happens to be 0 at one particular point which is a point somewhere there. So, k y is 0 and k x is some 4 pi by 3 root 3. So, you find that there is a gapless point there and if you expand around that point it actually looks like a Dirac cone. Okay, so, the gapless phase of this Kitai model which is this uh, middle equilateral triangle has this 
nice property that you know you get a Dirac point somewhere in the Pillion zone. Okay, so let me just pause here. So, uh, any questions so far? This entire thing is for all w is equal to 1. So, if you take the w's at random, it is actually very hard to solve. It is a disordered problem then, and it is very hard to find the energy levels, uh, the spectrum analytically. So, this is the only sector where you can find the uh, all the energy levels analytically. But it turns out that this is the ground state sector. If you look at the which state is the ground state of the entire system, it happens to lie in this sector where all the w's are plus 1. Okay. So, uh, Sorry, yeah. So, uh, can we have a, a gap, gapped phase considering only uh, by adding a mass term to the Hamiltonian irrespective of the choice of J1, J2, J3? You can, I will come to that a little later. You can, you can have, a, add something like a magnetic field which I will I'll come to. Okay. So, that was also discussed in Kita's paper. Okay. okay um, let me say a few words about edge states. So, it turns out, so this as I said this Kitai model is an example of a topological system. So, when you have a topological system you typically have states which run along the edges of the system. And so, in fact, they are there, um, but uh, it is quite interesting which phases those edge states are present in. So, if I take a zigzag edge like that, so, so this is actually a semi infinite system. So, it extends all the way down to infinity but at the top it looks like a zigzag edge right. The top row is all B side B sub lattice sides then the next row is A sub lattice sides and so on. So, what you do is that so, this is infinite this way it is semi infinite this way. So, because it is infinite this way you can introduce a momentum k which runs like that right. So, I have introduced I have put in this phase factors e to the i k n minus 1 e to the i k n and so on. So, what you can do is you can try to find the energies energy states of this system semi infinite system as a function of k. Okay. So, what you discover, so I am not showing the details here is that there are actually states which are present uh, for a certain range of k not the full possible range of k, but a certain range of k there are states which are uh, localized near this edge. In other words, they are plane waves when you go in this direction, but they decay exponentially when you go down into the bulk right. So, they are localized at the top edge. Uh, it turns out oops that uh, they all have 0 energy. Okay. So, by the way this is very similar to what happens in a zigzag edge in graphene. They are also you have uh, edge states for a certain range of k which have 0 energy for on a zigzag edge. Okay. So, uh, you have edge states here and but these edge states are only present in these two phases the gapless phase which I am calling B here this is from a different paper. So, the notation is different. Um, so, the, the, these uh, zero energy states on a zigzag edge are only there in this gapless phase B and this particular uh, gapped phase A is there. Uh, if you go down and look at the other edge where you have a zigzag edge of A sides, then you get um, again you get edge states here, but uh, oh I forgot to say something. So, the edge states that you get on the zigzag edge only live on the B sub lattice. So, the wave function is 0 on the A sub lattice. Okay. So, they only live on this this row, this row and so on. If you look at the other side they only live on the A sub lattice. Okay. Uh, this is also something that happens in graphene. Okay. So, actually there are a lot of similarities between the spectrum including edge states of the Kita model and graphene. Yes. Not Heisenberg, no, no, it is still not Heisenberg because the three bonds have, yeah, they, they have different couplings. Uh, you can also look at armchair edges. Um, so, then it turns out that if you look at an armchair edge which looks like that, then the modes live only on the B sub lattice in phases in the phase A and half of phase B, the left half of phase B, and you get modes which live only on the A sub lattice in the phase A x and the right half of phase B. Okay. Okay, so, this was all discussed in several papers I have just given one reference because you know I am most familiar with this paper, but uh, <laughs> I mean this was discovered by other people before us. Okay. Uh, this is Krishnendu Sengupta he will be here next week I guess. Okay. 
This week? Okay. Uh, okay, so I'll just mention that very briefly. Yes. Uh, so that's something I don't know much about, but I'll mention that. So as I said, there are certain things I'll mention without going into detail, and that's one of the things I will mention. Um, there's also something called topological order, which is the following. Um, that so everything I discussed so far is when the entire system is on a plane, right? Infinite plane or finite system in a plane. If you wrap it up in both directions, periodic boundary conditions, so that the thing lives on a torus, it turns out that the energy spectrum is independent of the product of the W's along two loops, which are shown in red. Okay, so let me go back because this may be a little hard to visualize on a torus. So what I mean by this is that you wrap, if you go far enough, then it wraps back to this, right? So you wrap it like this. You also wrap it like this. If you go far enough there, it wraps to this. Okay. So the claim is that if you do this kind of wrapping. So, you, this thing becomes a torus, then the energy spectrum is independent of the product of all the W's running this way and also all the W's running that way. This is very tricky because periodic boundary conditions are tricky with Jordan Wigner, but you can show this. Um, so, the product of all the W's in the two directions can independently take values plus or minus 1 and so all energy levels on a torus have a degeneracy of 4. So, this is a signature of something of topological order that uh, if you have a topological system, then it has uh, it may be non degenerate in the plane, but if you take a torus, it will have a certain degeneracy. If you take a torus is genus 1, if you go to genus 2, it will have higher degeneracy and so on. Okay. Um, some of you may know that this is also true in fractional quantum Hall states, which was which is the first known example of topological phase of a topological phase. Um, there also you have this kind of property that if you take uh, let us say a system with uh, fractional quantum Hall state with filling fraction one third, it is non degenerate on the plane, but if you made a torus of it, no one has done this experimentally, but theoretically if you make a torus, then it will have a degeneracy which is 3 to the power g on a genus g surface. So, on a torus it will be a degeneracy 3. So, something similar is happening here instead of 3 you have 4. right? So, in general for genus G you will have 4 to the power G degenerate ground states. So, that is a hallmark of a system with the topological order. Okay. So, I did not really define what topological order is, but okay, this is one of the features of a topologically ordered system. Okay, now, let me say get back to quantum statistics. So, back to the Kitai model on the plane. So, as I say the ground state lies in the sector in which all the hexagonal conserved quantities are 1. So, we call this a vortex free state. Yes. Right. So, if you have a genus 2 for example, right 2 holes, then you will have uh, I mean you will have more of these loops present on that and the product of W's on those loops will be conserved. Okay. So, if you have genus 2, uh, you can think of um, I do not know there must be 3 loops or something. Yeah, we can discuss this later, but you know depending on what the genus of a surface you have multiple loops which you cannot contract to a point. Okay. And for each such loop the product of W's along that loop can be plus or minus 1. Okay. So, you will get a factor of 2 in the degeneracy for every such loop. Okay, so, now uh, there was a question what happens if let us say you go away from the sector. So, suppose that uh, you make one of the hexagons have w equal to minus 1, but let us say all the other hexagons still have w equal to plus 1. So, that is called a vortex. So, we will say that if the hexagon which has w equals minus 1 is a vortex, then it turns out that the lowest energy state in a sector with one vortex is separated from the ground state by a finite gap. Okay, so, maybe uh, I should draw a picture at this state. Okay, so here is a sector all W equal to plus 1. So, can everyone see this? Maybe I should write it in the middle because I am missing some people on one side of the room. Okay. 
So, here is here is the sector they are all w equals plus 1. So, you have a ground state and then you have these excited states. Now, uh, this gap may or may not be 0, this depends on where you are in that equilateral triangle. Okay. Now, we are looking at a sector. So, this is the sector with no vortices. Now, let us say 1 w i equal to minus 1 and the, all the rest the other w i are plus 1. So, this is called the one vortex sector. So, here you will discover that that the ground state in this sector is separated from the ground state in this sector by a gap. Okay. And then you have these other excitations in this sector that again may be gapped or may not be gapped. Okay. So, this is what I meant that these are two different sectors corresponding to different choices of w, but there is a gap between the lowest energy state in this sector and the lowest energy state in that sector. So, um, so every time you create a vortex it needs a certain finite amount of energy to create a vortex. On the other hand the other the excitations which I will call the Majorana fermion excitations that may or may not be gapped that depends on what the values of this j 1, j 2, j 3 are. So, then one kit I have showed is the following that in the gapped phase the different particles either fermion and vortex they have abelian statistics. Okay. So, I am just stating what kit I have showed I am not going to it is not easy to show all this. So, if you exchange two fermions uh, you get a minus sign if you exchange two vortices um, I do not remember what happens if you exchange two vortices, but you just get a plus or minus one. And also if you take one particle around another, so you can take a fermion around a fermion or a fermion around a vortex uh, you only get wave you only get phases plus or minus one multiplying the wave function. If you just take one of them around another in a closed loop. So, in the gap phases uh, all the statistics between the same particle or the statistics between different particles are all abelian. Uh, things become very interesting in the gapless phase, but you have to be a little careful because uh, it is not easy to discuss statistics in a gapless system because when you exchange two particles okay, even if you do it very very slowly. So, so, typically you know you want to exchange things very slowly, so that you do not create unwanted excitations. But if your system is uh, gapless then even if you exchange things almost adiabatically you will necessarily create excitations, because in a gapless system you have excitations of arbitrarily low energy. Right. So, even if you are exchanging very slowly uh, there is certain finite ex you know um, ex uh, exchange rate and you always have particles whose energies are less than that rate and you will excite those particles. Yeah. So, you cannot yes right. So, you have to do something more which is which I am coming to the now. Okay, so, uh, so, gapless system is very hard to discuss statistics or even topological order. Uh, yes, yes, but um, hmm. but then you. You, yeah, you will not have an exact degeneracy anyway because of finite size effects. Yeah. So, uh, so Kita found a way out of this. So he said, um, let's try and adding a magnetic field at each side, and you can have a magnetic field in an arbitrary direction. Uh, so this produces a gap. However, you find that adding something like this actually uh, spoils the exact solvability of the problem because things a term like this does not commute with all the w's those hexagon invariants. Okay. So, even though it opens a gap and makes it possible to discuss statistics it really complicates the calculation. However, it has another benefit which is that once you add this then because it does not commute with the w's. So, now the w's can move from one hexagon to another earlier the w's could not move because they are conserved quantities, 
So, if you had a sector where w is plus 1 everywhere and it is minus 1 here, you will be stuck there forever, but now when you add this term uh, there is a finite rate of this w which is minus 1 moving from this hexagon to that to the next hexagon and so on. Okay. So, adding this uh, term has two benefits one it makes the system gapped and makes it possible to discuss statistics and also allows you to move around this hexagon invariants. Okay. And therefore, you know you can discuss what happens when you take one w and exchange it with another or, or fix one w minus one and take another round it and so on. So, then he showed that taking a fermion around a vortex gives a phase factor of minus one. So, that still looks abelian. However, taking one vortex around another vortex produces non abelian statistics. Okay. Now, this one uh, I am just writing some words here, um, uh, this may not be familiar to many of you. Um, so, what you get when you take one vortex and another is that you get uh, what are called the fusion rules of some of a particular conformal field theory which is the Isaac model in two dimensions. So, this has three operators uh, the identity, the uh, energy and the spin operator and they create you know the identity of course, does not do anything. This one creates a Majorana fermion epsilon and sigma creates a vortex and the fusion rules are given by this. So, for those of you who may know about this there are these uh, you can do this operator product expansions in any theory, but in particular in a conformal field theory which is you bring two operators close to each other in space. So, let us say uh, if you you bring a sigma r 1 sigma r 2 and bring r 1 close to r 2 then you find that uh, the when you do that then the product of sigma r 1 sigma r 2 looks like a sum of uh, identity operator plus an epsilon operator. Okay, so, that is an operator product expansion and um, so that is one meaning of these fusion rules. The other meaning is that these fusion rules also tell you what happens when you bring two particle when you exchange two particles or you take one around the other. Now, um, yes. So, it will be at r 1 plus r 2 by 2. So, it will be at the midpoint does not really matter you are bringing r 1 r 2 very close to each other. So, uh, this epsilon will be at some point there. Okay. So, it will be epsilon, but let us say it is uh, epsilon at the midpoint times some power of r 1 minus r 2 that is that is what the operator product expansion looks like. Now, the fact that the last fusion rule is the sum of two terms it turns out that this means that um, if you have a state with two vortices produced by sigmas you have a two dimensional wave function because you know the right hand side has two terms and when you exchange two vortices that changes the wave function by a unitary matrix. Okay. So, I am just stating this because you know there is a lot of uh, deep you know field theory which goes into all this. Okay, so, um, yeah, so, that is really what I want to say about quantum statistics. So, Kitayev shows all this in his paper that uh, exchanging two vortices actually gives you non abelian statistics. How much time do you have? 10, Ten minutes. Okay. Okay. Uh, let me say something about uh, correlation functions. So uh, let's consider a correlation uh, function of two spins, sigma i a and sigma j b. So i and j are the site labels, and a and b can be x y z. Okay. So let's look at this correlation function in a particular eigenstate of the Kitayev Hamiltonian. Now, um, you find that this thing has a very interesting structure in the Kitayev model and you can understand it like this. So, first of all if i and j are not nearest neighbor, so let us say i is here and j is there, then you can find one of the hexagon invariants which commutes with one of them, but does not commute with the other one. Okay. You can easily construct something like that. So, if i is here and j is here you pick a w which is on this hexagon which touches that site and so you can find a w which commutes with one and anti commutes with the other. So, I gave an example here, but you can see that this is uh, easy to construct. Now, since we know that every eigenstate of H is also can also be chosen to an eigenstate of W with eigenvalue plus or minus 1. So, if you have sigma i sigma j b in such an eigenstate, then I can put a W on the two sides right uh, for free because you know W acting on that state is plus or minus 1 and the product of the two W's will give you a plus 1. So, this is equal to that. Now, I bring the W's through and if it commutes with one and anti commutes with the other then this thing is equal to minus sigma i a sigma j b. 
So if this is equal to minus of itself, it means it must be zero. So if you take uh, two um, spin operators at two different sites, which don't have a hexagon in common, then that correlation function is exactly zero. Okay. Um, so by the way, this is all from this uh, very nice paper by um, written. Uh, all the authors were here, you know, math science. Uh, similar argument shows that even if their nearest neighbors i and j and uh, the bond joining them has an x x interaction, then this is 0 if either a or b is different from x okay, by the same argument because you can find a w which commutes with one of them, but does not commute with the other. So, the only way you can get this kind of correlation function to be non 0 is only if their nearest neighbors i and j and only if a and b are both equal to the type of bond, bond which joins i and j. Okay, so, if these are uh, two neighboring sites on the vertical bond z z, then sigma i z sigma j z that correlation will be non 0, but you take anything else sigma i x sigma j z or anything else you will get 0. Yes. This is actually true in any sector. Yeah, you, you just have to choose the state to be an eigenstate of all the w's and then this argument will go through. Yes, so this means that the spin correlation functions are extremely short range, they are only non zero if they are on neighboring sites and even then um, the these labels a and b have to be a very special kind, it has to be a, exactly the type of bond that joins those two. Okay, so, this is from this paper. Uh, now, all this was for um, equal time correlation functions. Okay. So, you can also look at um, correlation functions in time. So, it turns out this is more complicated. So, this is uh, this is worked out in various papers including this this paper. Uh, if you look at um, say correlation between sigma i a sigma i prime a prime at two different times, you find that in the gapless phase this falls off as a power of t. Uh, there is some power here which um, I have not written down it is there in this paper. So, it decays as a power law, but only if this i these two sites and these two labels satisfy the same constraints as before. Namely, i and i prime have to be nearest neighbors and a and a prime have to be of the type which is the bond joining them. Okay. You can also look at uh, four point correlation functions and that falls off as a fourth power. Okay. All right. So, this is um, so this is all in the gapless phase. Uh, this is also true if you add a small magnetic field, um, then also it decays as a fourth power with a coefficient which is proportional to the square of the magnetic field. Okay. Sorry. In the in the gapless phase, yes. In the gapped phase, it will fall off exponentially. So that's generally true in gapless phases. Uh, correlation functions generally fall off as power laws. Now, these were uh, uh, spin correlation functions that I talked about. You can also talk about correlations of Majorana fermions themselves. Now, Majorana fermion correlations are of course, very non-local in terms of spin correlation functions because of the string of sigma z's. Okay. But um, you can look at an operator like this, um, some operator O which is I a at site n and b at site n plus r. This will be only a function of r, it does not depend on n because of translation invariance. And you can show that this thing in the gapless phase will decay as a power of r for large r and in the gapped phase it will decay exponentially with r. So, again this is a kind of typical gapless phases correlations fall as power laws, gapped phases they fall exponentially. Okay. So, that is really all I will say about correlation functions. So, now um, let me tell you about a various generalizations of the Kitaev model. Um, so, here I will be very brief because these are things that I have not studied in detail myself. So, the Kitaev model involves three anti commuting matrices sigma x, sigma y, sigma z at each side and a coordination number of three because every bond, every side is coupled to three others. So, you can extend this in many ways. One is you can extend it to a model in which you replace every side in the honeycomb lattice by a triangle. Okay. Uh, then you still get some model which has a coordination number of 3 and so that was done in this paper 
and that is again exactly solvable. Uh, you can also uh, generalize this to a lattice in three dimensions, you can go from two to three dimensions, but keeping coordination number three is not easy to think of a lattice in three dimensions which has coordination number three, but um, this was done by uh, Saptarshi Mandal and Navin Surendran um, in this paper. Um, so, this is one of the very few generalizations of the Kitab model to three dimensions. Okay. Uh, you can generalize the model in other ways for example, you can have um, four anti commuting matrices like the Dirac matrices at each side and a coordination number of four like a square lattice and build a Kitab type model from that. So, this was done by in this paper or um, you know more complicated lattices not square, but more complicated lattices with Dirac matrices uh, or even higher dimensional matrices and that was done in this paper. Uh, so, this will take some time, so let me skip this. Some other studies, so people have studied what happens if there is a disorder in the j i right. So, what I have talked about so far are where all the j's are constant throughout the lattice, but what happens if they are disordered or if you um, remove some of the sites. So, vacant sites lead to a local moment and it shows effect shows up in the magnetic susceptibility. It also gives you some gives you some zero energy modes. So, there are some papers about this one is by um, Willens, Chalker and Monster, the other is by uh, Naranan here. Um, so, these are papers you can look at to see the effects of dilution and disorder. Uh, you can also look at what happens where you have magnetic impurities. Okay. Uh, so, you put an external spin um, and uh, it couples to the other spins in let us say Heisenberg fashion. Then you get unusual kind of condo effects with uh, some unstable fixed point at an intermediate coupling which is very unusual because normally fixed points are either they are at 0 coupling or infinite coupling, but you get fixed points at intermediate coupling. So, this was done by these people Vikram Tripathi, Shankar here and Kusum Dochak. There is also a classical Kitab model. So, you take the spins to be just classical variables. Uh, so, next time I will actually tell you what happens if you go beyond the classical limit. If you look at kind of the 1 over s corrections, but if you really take very large spin s look at the classical Kitab model, then that was studied by Deepak Dhar. Um, Kabir Ramola and Chandra, I do not remember his first, sorry? Samad Chandra, ok. So, they showed that you do not get this phenomena of order from disorder at low temperatures, ok. okay so, I should really stop there now. Is there in is there any generalization of Kitai model where people have looked at looked at like a next to next nearest neighbor interaction, or is it possible? Good question. Um, I don't know actually. Yeah, I I really don't know. Thank you. Usually what happens if you have next to next nearest neighbor interactions, um, when you go from spins to fermions you have you do not get quadratic Hamiltonians, you get fourth order fermions. So, but I do not know if people have done this. Uh, the Kitai model is this model frustrated model or non frustrated, because it has to uh, satisfy three bonding simultaneously. So, it is frustrated actually. In that sense. If you look at the classical limit for example, it is frustrated because you know uh, the so the spins on the x x bond for as far as that bond goes the spin would like to point along the x direction, right. but the same spin along the y y bond would like to point in the y direction to minimize that interaction. Okay. okay so, because every spin has three bonds x y and z it cannot satisfy you cannot minimize the energy of each of those three bonds at the same time. Uh, but so, it is definitely an example of a frustrated model. But if you uh, two components of spin for example, x y and z component and yeah. x component interact with uh, x another component y another component and z another component. So, is that there possibilities that uh, satisfying all component with no frustration? 
or it inherent to that? I am not sure I understand the model. The Kitan model is you know uh, this pin here has x x couplings with this, this y y with that and z z with this right. So, what is the model here okay. you have in mind? We can discuss this. If it has trusses and then what about ground state degeneracy? So, this is in the largest limit that I was, I was talking about that you cannot every spin cannot cup, cannot minimize all the three interactions. Um, so, that is that is why you get a very you get a very disordered kind of ground state that is what show, was shown in this paper if you look at the classical Kitana model. So, in the next uh, lecture I will tell you uh, what happens when you go beyond the classical limit right you, you introduce spin wave corrections. So, you see that uh, you will see that you get a little bit of order from disorder you do not remove the disorder completely, but you reduce the number of um, ground classical ground states by some number. So, you have to wait for the next lecture. <laughs>